TMZ TV. I'm realizing now how important this verse Romans 8 3 is, and I'm afraid I give it I gave it short shrift in on Monday's show. Um, I was I was tired and uh, well I was exhausted actually and I don't think I really gave it the emphasis that was do it. So I want to do that today for you, ladies and gentlemen. This might be a short show. I'm kind of sick now. I, I don't know, maybe I picked up something on the way home or whatever, but I woke up this morning with a sore throat. And uh, so, you know, cigarettes the best cure for that. So I'll do what I can here, but I've been thinking about it since Monday. And so I want to emphasize that Jesus Christ condemns sin in the flesh. This is, I realize now what an unusual statement this is. And as far as I know, this has never been explained to me or I've never, well, it hasn't been explained to me in any kind of detail, nor have I appreciated the uniqueness of this construction, of this wording. And I'll tell you why it's unique in a second. Hi, everyone. Martin Zender. I'm back from the Virginia Conference. Got back yesterday at 9, last night at 9.30. It's great to be away. It's great to get back home, get back to the routine. I miss everyone there. Um, Greg Davis recorded the whole conference. Well, I don't even have my microphone plugged in. I tell you, I'm not on my game right now, but I'm going to be on my game when I start talking about Romans 8.3. You're going to notice the difference. I want to plug my microphone in. Three, two, one. Boom. Is that better? You see the difference equipment makes? There you have it. This is Martin Sender. Welcome to MCTV. I'm back at the edge of the bottom of the Florida Peninsula. Christ Jesus, our Savior, condemns sin in the flesh. It's such a strange saying because... It doesn't say that he took away our sin. Other verses say that. It doesn't say we're justified. Other verses say that we are justified. He did take away our sin. But this is such a unique statement, and it's saying something different than any other verse is saying. Let me read this again, get a context for you. I'll start with Romans 8.1. Nothing consequently is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Consequent to what? Consequent to God declaring us to be righteous. How can anything be condemnation to those who God proclaims to be righteous? It's impossible. Nothing consequently, based on Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, nothing consequently is, condemn is now condemnation. Used to be, but not now. To those in Christ Jesus, not according to flesh are they walking. As I said, this not this has nothing to do with your sin. It has to do with your disposition. I'll say that again. Not according to flesh are they walking, but according to spirit. This doesn't have to have to do with sin, but with your disposition. What are you listening to? Are you listening to your flesh, or are you listening to the Spirit's declaration of life? This is another case of flying by your instruments, flying by the Word of God, believing what it says, not trusting your feelings, not looking down at your body. I've given you the analogy of a pilot who is trained to fly by his instruments. If a pilot is not trained to trust his instruments and is trained only to base his attitude in the air on the ground, on his perception of the ground, where he is in space, if that goes away, if a pilot is surrounded by a whiteout, cannot get any orientation on the ground, then you can so easily become disoriented. And you must look at those instruments. You must trust your attitude indicator that your wings are level. You must trust that your nose is level, not up, not down. And it may, everything in your body might be screaming against what the instruments are telling you. This is why my dad took this training. I was in the plane with my dad when he was learning, getting his instrument rating. And when the instructor's training a pilot, he puts a hood on you that doesn't allow you to look at the ground. So you're flying completely by your instruments. And it's like, trust the instrument, trust the instrument, 
trust the instrument. Our instrument is the Word of God. And we trust the instrument that says, you are declared to be righteous. And we apprehend this by faith. It has to be by faith now because faith is an assurance concerning things which are not being observed. Likewise, the pilot's instruments, when he's flying in a white owl, can't see anything. The pilot's instruments is his assurance concerning things, that is his attitude in space, how he's going, how he's flying, which are not being observed. And the Word of God is our instrument. Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, our instrument as to how God sees us. You simply must believe this. This is why this righteousness given to us by God is apprehended by faith. Faith is the channel through which we appreciate this truth. And this is the truth. So Jesus Christ did take away our sin, but this verse isn't saying that. Let's finish reading it in context. Nothing consequently is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Not according to flesh are they walking. So not, they're not, those in Christ Jesus are not walking in accord with what they see their flesh doing, what they perceive their flesh to be doing. It's as foolish to monitor your attitude in God's opinion by looking at your flesh as it is for a pilot trained to fly by instruments to try to gain his attitude by looking out the window. You can't look out the window. Don't 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 look in the mirror. Don't listen to what your friends are telling you. Don't listen, in Paul's case, in Galatians, don't listen to what the Galatians are telling you because the Galatians had all sorts of outside influence screaming at them that they were not justified. This is what the whole armor of God is about. Protection against Satan's lies. If you try to look out the window, you're going to falter. You're going to fail. That's what Peter did when he was walking on the water. He looked out the window. When our Lord called Peter out of that boat, as long as Peter was looking at Christ, looking at his instrument, not gauging what he was doing by looking at the waves, looking at the wind, considering that he was heavier than water. Yeah, you're heavier than water, Peter, but don't think about that right now. Keep your eyes centered upon Christ and you'll stay afloat. But Peter couldn't handle it because the wind blew and all of a sudden his attention was diverted. This is fatal for a pilot. This is what did in JFK Jr. This is what did in JFK Jr. and his wife and his wife's sister. Got into a whiteout. Wasn't trained. It was dark. Couldn't see the lights of the shore anymore. Got away from the shore of, of New York. The lights gave him a perspective of where he was. When that disappeared, he, he, he just... When you pan you panic, that's what happens. Pilots panic. This is why it takes training, 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 not to panic, and you just look at that instrument, and you will swear that your instruments are wrong because your body's telling you something else. But the body's a liar. The body is a liar. Your flesh is a liar. Your friends telling you that you should be more concerned about your flesh. They're liars. The word flesh is going to come up here in our key passage here. And the flesh is a liar. I can't say that enough. This is beautiful. I love this video so far. Absolutely love it. This is exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that I just wasn't focused in enough on this verse. And I've been thinking about it ever since. So let's continue. Not according to flesh are they walking. Let's put it this way. They're not looking out the window. This is good. All right, let me, let me apply the airplane analogy to this passage. Nothing consequently is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That's the instrument. That's the word of God. Not according to flesh are they walking. These people are not looking out the window, but they're walking according to spirit. They're looking at their instrument. They're not looking out the window. They're not looking in the mirror. They're not considering themselves after the flesh. Yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a parallel passage here. Not considering themselves according to flesh. It's crucial in Paul's gospel to do this. Why? Because the truth is so radical. And again, the whole problem is our revelation is ahead of our bodies. As I've been telling you, the body of sin is not yet nullified. 
which shall be discarded soon. So they're not looking out the window. They're not walking in accord with the flesh, with what they see their flesh doing. You see, this can't mean, this can't mean, not walking according to flesh can't mean that they're not sinning. It can't mean that. Because even to understand that you are sinning, you would have to consider yourself according to flesh. This is what the Christians always do. They're looking at themselves constantly according to flesh. So they misinterpret this verse. Walking according to flesh, they think, is sinning. No, walking according to flesh is looking at the flesh, monitoring it, hoping that it will give you some positive feedback as to how God sees you. Boy, I said it perfectly there. Hoping that the flesh gives you some positive feedback as to how God sees you. Don't ever do that. That's a lie. But I'm telling you, your Christian friends will pull you into that world. That's their world. They want you to be enmeshed in that world just like they are because misery loves company. No, no, no. We're not walking according to flesh. We're walking according to spirit. That is, we're looking at our instrument and we have the audacity to believe what God says about us. Four, the spirit's law of life. And again, I told you on Monday that this was a joke phrase. It is. Next time somebody says to you, you need to be more concerned about the law. I need you to say, I am concerned about it. I do have a law. I am following the law. And they'll say, oh, that's good. And you'll say, well, wait a minute. Maybe you don't understand what law I'm talking about. I'm talking about the law of life in Christ Jesus. That's my law. The law of life. You see, it's not really a law at all. It's a fun law. It's a great law. It's a, it, it's a whimsical law. The law of life. The law of life. What did the law of Moses bring? Death. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, all of it. The law is a dispensation of death and a dispensation of condemnation. I think that's 2 Corinthians 3, 7. What does this verse say? Nothing consequently is now condemnation. <laughs> so there you go. We're not in the realm of law of Moses. And Paul points that out here because he contrasts the law of life in Christ Jesus with the law of sin and death. This is what he said. The law of life, the Spirit's law of life. Oh, this isn't Moses' law of death. The Spirit's law of life. I know I said this Monday, but I didn't ring the chamois enough. I need to ring the juice out of this baby. That's what I'm trying to do now. Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus frees you from the law of sin and death. That's the law, the Mosaic law. Even if the law of Moses had come to us, which it did not, we are free from it. Free from the law of sin and death. What frees us from that? The law of life in Christ Jesus. The law of life. It's a You see what I mean? It's a figure of speech called the figure of retention. Paul's retaining the term law and he's reapplying it in a facetious way, really. Here's a law for you. How about the law where you don't have to worry about anything? How's that for a law? Yeah, it's my law. Well, the law of life in Christ Jesus frees you from the law of sin and death. For what was impossible to the law in which it was infirmed through the flesh did God, sending his Son in the likeness of, of sin's flesh. Now see, the way I used to read this was sending his own Son in the likeness of sin's flesh and concerning sin. I like made those, made that clause go together in relation to what Christ did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sin's flesh and concerning sin. No, this is what I want you to do. There's no punctuation in the original text, so I have literary license to do what I'm about to do, and this has never been done before on any broadcast, as far as I know. For what was impossible to the law in which it was infirm through the flesh did God, sending his own son in the likeness of sin's flesh. Period. And concerning sin, see how I'm, you see what I'm doing? I'm starting that as a new thought. And concerning sin, are you concerned about sin? Okay. Here's God's answer to that. Concerning sin, he, that is Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus condemns Sin in the flesh. Okay, this is what that means. Christ Jesus condemns the sin, and we do. St I'm not saying we don't sin anymore. If we didn't sin anymore, none of these exhortations would be necessary. Think about that. If we didn't sin anymore, why is Paul even writing this? Paul is writing Romans 
four, five, six, seven, and eight, to people who sin. And it's not about what, it's not about how to get rid of your sin. It's not. It's about what to do with the fact that you do sin. Because I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, hate to break this to you, but until we are snatched away and made immortal, we will continue to fail in the flesh. And if you're walking according to flesh, you will fall, you will fail, you will be discouraged. You're looking out that window constantly, looking down at your body. Remember Abraham? Abraham considered his body that it was as good as dead. Romans chapter 4. Ro uh, yeah, Abraham considered his body. That was his first mistake, considered his body. Well, in a way, it was a good prelude. It was a necessary prelude to understanding the miracle that God was going to do. He knew it was as good as dead. I guess it's helpful to know that in light of what God's going to do with Abraham. Likewise, I guess it's nice to know, and Paul makes sure we know in Romans chapter 3, not one is righteous, no, not one. All have sinned, all have gone out of the way. That's the preparation for this. Paul is wrecking the whole human race in Romans 3. 10, 11, 12. He blows up the worldly people and he blows up the Israel types and he blows up everybody. No one righteous, no, not one. Now, you got that? Now get ready for this. We are now under the jurisdiction of the second Adam, the last Adam, I should say, who pronounces us justified. So Jesus Christ, he did take away the sin, but he condemns the sin in your flesh. He sees the sin in your flesh. This is, he sees the sin in your flesh. It's, what's unusual is to see condemned sin in the flesh. That's the, that's the mystery. What, what, why did he condemn sin in the flesh? He already took away sin. And what way is he condemning sin in the flesh? He's condemning, in case you haven't done it yet, he's condemning. He's, that is, uh, condemning just means a, it's a down judgment. He's judging the bad things you do and he's just throwing it down throwing it out so before you can even consider it he has condemned sin in the flesh not in his flesh in your flesh as I said on Monday I thought this was the best thing I said on Monday it doesn't say he's condemning Martin Zender or he's condemning you he's not condemning the sinner Martin Zender he's not condemning the sinner insert your name here he's condemning the sin of the sinner. That is, that part of us that still fails because we're still in the flesh. And so he has already taken away sin, like the chicken with its head cut off, the death blow has been administered to sin, and yet the chicken still tours the barnyard. Our bodies are behind the revelation, so we're still sinning. Jesus Christ is ready for that. He has a good word for you concerning the sins that you still do, consequent to being pronounced righteous by God because God sees you as a new creation. Here's the good word. Jesus Christ condemns that sin. He slaps it down. He sees it. He knows you're doing it. He's not alarmed. He's not saying, oh, that's terrible. I guess I made a mistake justifying these people. No, he condemns sin in the flesh. That's the mysterious phrase I never quite understood. Condemns sin in the flesh flesh. So every time your flesh rises up and you're tempted to look out the window, I want you to run this phrase th through your mind. Jesus Christ condemned my sin in the flesh. So why am I paying attention to it? Why am I letting it bother me? And you might say, well, you're, you'll never get rid of your sin then. False. The only chance you have of walking a walk worthy of the Lord and we all want to do that it, it this is a paradox it doesn't happen by concentrating on it it doesn't happen by manhandling it by trying to fix it It happens by ignoring it it happens by acknowledging that your sin has been taken away the life force has been cut out of it that is there's no more guilt and condemnation associated with it but because of the problem that we still do it in spite of the revelation this verse was dictated to Paul by the Holy Spirit, by God, which says, don't worry, the same Christ Jesus that took away the sin of the world also condemns the sin in your flesh. Not condemning you. That's the, it's not condemning you. 
He's condemning that crap you still do. He's slapping it down so that it can't bite you. It can't get a hold of you. It can't drag your apprehension away from the beautiful truth that God has pronounced you righteous. He's not condemning the sinner here. How could he possibly? We're declared righteous. He's condemning sin in our sluggish flesh and the flesh that has not yet gotten the memo our apprehension has the memo that we're declared righteous and that we're justified, but the flesh is slow to respond. Not to worry, friends. Jesus Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned the sin in your flesh. As soon as it pops up, it's like whack-a-mole. It's like a divine whack-a-mole. As soon as that sin comes up, down judgment. Take the hammer, you whack the mole. It's a down judgment. Jesus is playing whack-a-mole with all your sins. So as soon as you do something, boom, condemn sin in the flesh. Condemn sin in the flesh. This is something above and beyond him taking away the sin of the world. Because the wording is different. The wording is very, very unique. Never appreciated it until now. Condemn sin in the flesh. So he's gotten to it before you even realize it. Yeah, he's way ahead of you on this one. Okay, so Way ahead of you on this one. Why does he do that? So that the just requirements, I'll finish with this, so that the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who are not walking in accord with flesh but in accord with spirit. Like I said, the only way, this is not doing the law of Moses, this is the requirements of the law of Moses. You can't, you can't meet the requirements of the law of Moses by doing the law of Moses. That seems like a paradox. It's okay by me? I guess it is a paradox. How do you do it? By walking according to spirit. It's the only way. And when you're walking according to spirit, you're ignoring the flesh. Again, walking in accord with flesh is paying attention to the flesh. Nothing to do with whether you sin or not. Walking according to spirit is apprehending the things that the spirit is telling you concerning you. Read Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and 8. And that is that you're justified apart from works of law. That's a great thing. And so the only way that those things that the law purported to produce for people who could possibly fulfill it, which nobody can. The only way you can actually live a life that actually is void, fairly void of sinning or improving, let's say this, is not by trying to do it. It's by walking according to spirit, by trusting your instrument, by trusting the whack-a-mole program. Eight, Romans 8.3 is a whack-a-mole verse. Whack-a-mole verse. Condemn sin in the flesh. He's on it before you are, and only then, by you being freed of the guilt and condemnation, will you be in the right attitude, will you have the right disposition, will you be at peace? And it'll take the desire to sin away. Law never took the desire to sin away. Read Romans 7. Law actually incited the desire to sin. It's all in Romans 7. Paul said, I did not even think of coveting until the law said, thou shalt not covet. Then the law, getting an incentive through the precept of all things, produces in me all manner of coveting. You want to get out of that cycle? Then ignore it. Trust the whack-a-mole. Ignore the flesh. Walk according to spirit. It's paradoxical. Hardly anybody trusts it. The Christians can't trust it because they don't trust anything they can't see. So we trust it, even though we don't see it. We trust that... We trust the declaration, we fly by our instruments, and it'll keep you at the right attitude all the time. And paradoxically, it will also produce the peaceable fruits of righteousness.